G'day and welcome to the Grow Small Business Podcast. I'm your host, Troy Truen. Each week, we speak with an owner who has grown a business with 5 to 30 team members to something bigger. Diving into their numbers and unearthing the pain they've experienced, we explore what they did to overcome each barrier and what they would do differently from day one. Let's get into it. Welcome everyone. Today I'm interviewing John Warlow from the Value Builder System based in Toronto, Canada. Thanks for your time today, John. Hey, it's very good to be with you. Let's start with how we know each other. Mick had you on our Quick Fire Friday cast episode 370 a year or so ago, and I've listened to all three of your books, and I'm a quarter of the way through your awesome and almost nine-year-old podcast called Built Cell Radio. And as I said before we hit record, you're obviously a glutton for punishment. That's a lot of Warlow content. Three to four episodes a week. I love it. It's just gold. I recommend it to a lot of people. There's so many great lessons, not just on how to grow your business, but particularly how to exit all the mistakes people made, not just legally, but in negotiation and picking up that intel sometimes where you are able to claw out of the guest what their multiple on EBITDA was or top line is really valuable for business owners considering exiting one day. And I will also say the three books you've written, Built to Sell, The Art of Selling a Business and The Automatic Customer are also awesome resources. Really encourage the audience to get into those. Thanks, Troy. Appreciate that. And tell our audience a bit about your business, what it does and how it makes money. Yeah. Value Builder helps an entrepreneur understand the value of their company and how they might go about improving it. And our business model is to license that technology, the valuation algorithm and the corresponding reports associated with it to independent advisors. We make money through providing people like Mick, your partner and others access to this software that they use with their clients. Yeah, fantastic. I know Mick raves about it. I think he got into the Value Builder system only about five or six months ago, and he's really enjoying it and seeing a lot of value added for their clients as well. How did you start That's out? Great. It's kind of a funny story. I wrote a book called Built to Sell, which you referenced in the beginning, which was my first book that was really not written with any sort of grand business strategy in mind. You know, people write a book these days because they want to raise their profile, they want to increase their personal brand. I didn't really write it for any of those reasons. I sort of had some time after an exit of my own, and I wanted to kind of put some ideas on paper and I wrote it and my wife and I, our two young kids left and moved to Europe. And if you've ever want to promote a book and that's like the worst thing you could possibly do because the way you promote a book is you go on a speaking tour and we moved to a little town in the, in the southern part of France and totally inaccessible for speaking events, but we did that. But long story short, in addition to the book, we bought the URL built to sell.com and I put a little test, a quiz on to the website. It was like 10 questions to evaluate how sellable your company is. And I started to get calls and emails from advisors, business coaches, M&A professionals saying, hey, can we use your quiz on your website? Because we want to use it with our clients because we think it'll be a good way to start conversation with business owners. And I was in Europe and we were kind of starting to think about what I might do next. And I thought, you know, like there's a need for tools to help advisors start this big conversation with the owners that they work with. And so I started licensing that technology, the simple questionnaire at the time to advisors. And then the rest is history. Today, we're 100% advisor-led, meaning 100% of our revenue comes from advisors. And that's the way we've chosen to go to market. And so you really fell into the value builder system just after the book. You kind of, wow, that's amazing. Yeah, it was called the sellability score. And we trained our first group of advisors. I think it was probably 2015, maybe something like that. And I remember they kind of put me on the spot in the middle of the training. And they said, like, we don't like the name. I'm like, what do you mean you don't like the name? Like, that's the name. Well, we don't like the name because a lot of business owners don't want to sell, but they all want to build value. And so I remember in like a whim, got up on my feet saying, all right, we'll change the name. Because yeah. at the time we didn't have any customers and it was like no skin off my nose to basically change the name. We changed it from the sellability score to value builder. And the kind of rest is history. And I think therein lies a really interesting tidbit, which is you know, for a lot of business owners, they don't necessarily want to sell right now, but they would like to know they could sell. It's like having the option is important to them. That was a good lesson for me. It's been helpful for our growth as a company because value builder is about how do you improve the value of your company and whether you want to sell it or not is somewhat irrelevant. Yeah, it's becoming even more and more pertinent getting businesses ready for sale if you want to. You'd know the stat, but is it something like 90% of businesses are put on the market and never end up selling? Is it some huge number like that? Yeah, I don't have the latest data and I wouldn't have it for the Australian market, but it is a very high percentage. And you know, that part of that is that businesses go to market when they're not really prepared to go to market. And many of them haven't really done the stuff we talk about in Value Builder to kind of get them ready to go to market. And so they kind of get halfway through due diligence and falls off the rail. It's a big
big proportion of businesses that get listed that don't sell. And the value builder system at the moment, I think is even more relevant given the tectonic shift in with boomers retiring out of business, helping them get prepared if they do want to sell their business to aid their or assist their retirement, I think is even more important than ever in this current age. Yeah. Exit Planning Institute, which is a global organization of people that do exit planning, says that it's in their markets, which would include Australia, New Zealand, eight out of 10 business owners say they want to exit in the next decade. Within the decade, they plan to exit. So it's a big proportion. They're talking about it in their Vistage groups, in their forum groups, in their peer-to-peer groups. But business owners don't kind of advertise that they want to sell, right? Like it's not like they walk around with a name badge saying, I want to sell. And for the advisors who want to help them, they need a way to initiate the conversation and a way to sort of start the conversation with a business owner in a way that puts them in a good light and also is provides a meaningful sort of value-added experience for the owner. And so that's kind of what we do is we help them start that conversation. Yeah, great. Well, maybe go right back to the start, university, corporate job, and any businesses you've had up to the value builder system. Yeah, I went to school for communications and I dropped out early because it was a terrible program. I went to work in radio and left there and started a radio show about entrepreneurs. This goes back to 1993. <laughs> so think of what we're doing right now. Yep. But what is that, 30 years ago? No, more. 31 years ago. Yeah, thanks for that. Appreciate yeah. that. And we got it nationally syndicated in Canada, nine radio stations in the country held this show. We did it for three years. I built a syndication company around it and sold it. It was a great show, but I got a taste for entrepreneurship through interviewing them and then started a couple of business ones, an event planning business, another marketing agency, which I wrote about marketing agencies in the book Built to Sell. I had a quantitative market research business, which is a market intelligence company that was acquired by a publicly traded company in 2008. Then as I say, took a couple of years off and spent time with my family and recharged and then started Value Builder. Did you start Value Builder in 2015? or was it 2018? No, we started in 2012. But again, it was very nascent. In the early days, it was like licensing this little tiny questionnaire to a few people. It was very sort of rudimentary at the time. And how old were you in 2012, 12 years ago now when you started Value Builder? Probably 40. I'm 52 now. So 12 years ago, yeah, 40. You have some key numbers you can share to illustrate the growth of the Value Builder business? Yeah, for sure. We are now roughly 1,100 advisors around the world, independent advisors that bring our message to their clients. We've got 54 four full-time employees based in Toronto, eight-figure revenue kind of business. So that's kind of where we are. That's awesome. And so starting out, that was just yourself, 12 years Yeah, ago. yeah. Yep. And that's amazing growth, John. Well done to you and the team. When was the that's moment you felt like you had succeeded? I don't know that in the process of building, I feel that way. I feel like there's always more to do and I don't really ever feel like I've succeeded. For me, succeeding is selling a business. It's like you're a sportsman. I, I mean, like it's like running a marathon and getting to mile, you know, kilometers. 41. To me, I feel success when I sell it because it's the ultimate validation. That's a very personal answer to that question. Because I, So I won't feel successful necessarily like Value Builder was successful until I sell it. That's a peculiar idiosyncrasy of my personality. But for me, it's the ultimate validation. I'm a baseball fan. It's crossing home plate. Like you can stay on third and you don't get any runs. I don't feel necessarily like it's been successful yet. Does that answer the next question then? What does success look like to you? It's that, that exit portion? Yeah. Yeah, to me, that is it. Maybe a little less practical, a little bit more emotional. To me, success is kind of like I attributed or think of the parenting analogy. You know, for a lot of parents, they have high aspirations for their kids. But if they're honest with themselves, the ultimate aspiration most of us have as parents is that our kids go off into the world and do good things and are happy. And, you know, they don't need to be the president of the United States or the captain of the football team or whatever. If they're happy and independent and doing something they love, we'll feel like job well done. For me, building a business, the ultimate sort of goal is that it can run without me. That's like if it as my job is not really the CEO of Value Builder, more like the parent. And so I'm always thinking, how do I get this thing to run without me? Like I'm always trying to make decisions so that other people can make the business run without me. So that's sort of a philosophical idea that I'll know, you know, I know when it's successful, when I can go on vacation, for example, and I come back and like things were better than when I left. Like that's the ultimate and sort of validation that it's working. Number one thing you'd recommend to marketing a fast growing business. I mean, it's it's tired and tried advice, but niche down. There's a temptation we have as entrepreneurs to grow revenue. And I interviewed a woman named Stephanie Breedlow on Built to Sell Radio. I'm not sure if you've heard this episode yet. It's kind of one of the earlier ones, but Gosh, Stephanie this is, built. This is a great story. I think you mentioned this for Mick on the Quick Fire Friday episode. Did I? Yeah. yeah, yeah it's, do it's, tell. This it's, is an awesome one. Yeah, I know. It's an incredible example to me of the difference between growing revenue and growing value. Because as entrepreneurs, the BRW 100 celebrates the fastest growing companies in Australia. And their metric for growth
growth is revenue. And we often get lulled into the sense of like revenue growth is the ultimate arbiter of success. And yet value is the ultimate arbiter of success. So here's an example. So Stephanie built this company. She was doing payroll for parents who have a nanny. It's a yeah. very kind of niche thing. And she got to 300 grand in revenue, one employee, and it became more difficult for her to acquire customers because she'd kind of run out of selling to her friends and neighbors. And everybody on stage, every book, every kind of pundit was saying at the time, it's eight times easier to cross sell your existing customer a new product or service than it is to go find a new customer. Everybody was saying that. And yet something in Stephanie's back of her mind knew that that was the wrong answer because she had a niche in doing payroll for parents who had a nanny to pay. She needed to know the first thing about all the other things that they might need. And you know, everybody was saying, well, busy parents also need lawn care services and meal delivery services. And you should sell all these things to your existing customers. And she's like, no, we have this unique knowledge about how to set up payroll for parents who have a nanny to pay. Anyways, 25 years later, she built the business to $9 million in revenue is when she approached care.com. Care.com is like the Angie's list of care providers. You plug in your postal code and it will give you like a babysitter or an au pair in your local market. So you're in Tasmania. If you're in Hobart, you're like, okay, great. Here's the nannies and au pairs available in Hobart. They're all five-star rated. Great. They had 7 million subscribers. And so Stephanie had a $9 million business with 10,000 customers. And, and they, they, and they bought it six times, didn't they? 54 million. They bought it for six times revenue, not that's six right. times EBITDA. Yeah, that's amazing. And yeah, $54 million. And that would never have happened had Stephanie not done, had not focused on the one thing. I'm a big believer in focusing on value over revenue. And so from a marketing perspective, what that means is doing one thing and yeah. being the best at one thing. Yeah, I think that's a really good shift in thinking around value, not revenue. So that's a great message for the audience. How did you fund the business, Value Builder? Yeah, Value Builder has been funded just out of cash flow. I had had some successful exits before. I invested some initial seed money to get the business started, but we've never had to go outside for outside investment in part because we have training for advisors who join the Platinum Work Forum. And so they we get a mixture of SaaS revenue, recurring revenue, as well as some training revenue, which helps fund the business in the short term. We've just done it out of cash flow. Yeah, and now we're profitable. We haven't had to go outside for capital. And was your second book, The Automatic Customer, or was that your third book? That's right. Yeah. Second. Built to Sell and then The Automatic Customer. Yeah. yeah, that's right. And for the audience, even if you don't have a SaaS business, that book is excellent to change your thinking about what you can do in your business to get that recurring revenue, which is a lot more valuable as you have plenty of examples in that book. Really encourage the audience to listen to read all of those three books, but particularly The Automatic Customer is a real gem, I think. Yeah, thanks. And you're right. It's one of the most underrated ways for companies to create recurring revenue. You know, when they hear software, you know, when they hear recurring revenue, they often think software as a service, right? They think, oh yeah, like software. That's what you're talking But in fact, many companies improve their value by creating subscription, like home service businesses. If you have a home service business, you're doing lawn care, you're doing pest control. Any of these businesses can benefit tremendously from a service contract where they build up a book of business, which is guaranteed. Because again, an acquirer is going to want to look at your company and say, how's this thing going to run when you're gone? And you know, recurring revenue on a dollar for dollar basis can be worth you know, two, three, four times that of installation or one-off revenue easily. And in some cases, more than that. Again, I'm not a believer in growing revenue for growth's sake. It's sort of a vanity metric, to be honest. And yet the most valuable companies are ones oftentimes in the smallest niches. They've got recurring revenue. They do one thing better than anybody else. I just did an interview with a guy who does help brake manufacturers catalog their AutoCAD designs. This is a nine employee company in a sleepy part of the economy. No one's ever cared about how to like archive brake caliper drawings in AutoCAD, yet he sold the business for 10 times revenue. It's an incredible story, but it happened because he was the guy in the brake industry and he didn't succumb to the temptation of chasing revenue, which would have diluted his value proposition for both his consumers, but also his acquirers. Because acquirers, they don't want to buy something they don't need. Like they want to buy something that they find it particularly hard to compete against, or it would take too long and too annoying to compete against. So they just buy it. And that's when they're willing to pay a premium. But if you've taken your jewel in your crown, that one thing that makes you special and padded it with a bunch of ancillary, undifferentiated products and services, an acquirer's going to look at that and say, I don't want this kind of Neapolitan ice cream. Like I don't want all this other stuff. You're going to want to pay for your entire business. And all they want is the one jewel in the crown. Yet you've created this entire infrastructure, people, infrastructure around all this other business. And your acquirer probably won't value it. They don't need you to differentiate for them, or I should say diversify for them. They want the one thing that's unique and they'll go out and be happy to diversify over time because they're much larger. It's a kind of common theme in a lot of stuff we do. If you were to start up today with plenty of funding, would you go into your industry? Yeah, I, 
in our industry, if we define assessments, value assessments, yeah, I think I would. I think there's for all the momentum stats we talked about, eight out of 10 business owners planning to exit. Assessments are obviously a SaaS based product, which are globally available. It's huge TAM, total addressable market. Yeah. As a fellow podcast host, you've got that same habit. You always have to explain the acronyms when guests. Can you outline the most stressful point in your small business growth journey so our audience can learn from it? It's not in Value Builder. I would say that the most stressful time that I recall was in the market and intelligence business that I built. And I had hired a general manager to IC, a second in command, to run the company day to day. And we'd had a particularly good relationship over the years. Her compensation was tied to EBITDA and her variable compensation was tied to EBITDA. And we built this business up together with her running it really day to day for many years and her getting increasingly well paid as a result of the success she was having. And I went through a period where I decided that I wanted to sell that market intelligence business. And we went through a process process of making it more of a sellable company. We wanted to create a subscription base and made a whole bunch of changes. Those changes in the long term were improving the value of the business, but in the short term, they were undermining our profitability. And that meant that she and I were loggerheads, like fighting like cats and dogs over the direction of this company. And as that happens in any company, you know, when mom and dad are fighting, half the kids gravitate to one parent, the other half gravitate to the other parents. So like literally the company was sort of divided in two factions. And ultimately I had to let her go. I own the company 100%. I was ultimately in control, but it was not a pretty time. It was incredibly stressful for me, for her, for the company. A bunch of people left when I let her go. As a result, the people loyal to her also chose to leave in many cases. It was a very stressful time. What I learned from that is that if you're going to hire a senior person, in particular a 2IC or a general manager, it's really important to align their compensation to your compensation as the owner. If your goal is to go out boots first and build the business over 50 years and then die in the saddle, then yeah, tying their compensation to profitability probably makes sense. But if your goal is to sell within five years, then you may want to think about it. At least the mistake I made was tying compensation to a short-term metric, which wasn't necessarily aligned always with building value. Yeah, it's a really great point. What area in business do you feel you've had to work on the most to add the greatest value? Managing people has always been an Achilles heel for me. I'm not a good manager of people. And, and part of that, I've I'm just not patient, I'm not always attentive to details. I'm not great at follow-up. I don't have great systems. And you know those great managers, they're just so steady. Like they've got their system, their process. You have your one-on-one and they ask you the same questions and they give you feedback and they remember to thank you and they do all, like they're very, really solid. That's not me. I've really had to work on that. I'm still not great at it, but I'm learning. I'm trying to do better. It's just not my strength to really be a good manager of people. Yeah, it reminds me of a story I read the other week the Olympics in the USA were beaten by the Chinese for many consecutive Olympics in the 70s and 80s. It might have been in 1984. Where was the Olympics? LA in 1984, I think. Yeah, I think that's right. Yeah. I think the American coach had enough crack to shits, walked over to the Chinese coach and said, oh, just how do you, can you just tell me, how do you guys keep doing this? Olympics after Olympics keep beating us. And the Chinese coach turned around and said, well, we only focus on one thing and that's strengths. Whereas you try to fix your weaknesses. Yeah, great story. Yeah, that's interesting. I go back and forth on that concept because you're right. Like someone would say, well, John, like you're not a good manager. Well, that's fine. Hire someone to manage the people and you can go off and do the things that you're good at. I agree with that. And at the same time, I do have to manage some people and even if it's just one. And so I'm still not great at it. I'm working on it. Are you a small business owner? You know that getting recruitment right can make or break your team's success. Just one mishire can cost your business up to 27 times their salary. Finding and retaining top talent is a challenge, especially in today's competitive market. That's where our ultimate recruitment toolkit comes in. Over 10 intensive days, our online course is designed specifically for small business owners like you. We'll walk you through the process of sourcing and securing A players for your team. Here's what you'll gain. Learn the proven strategies to pinpoint and attract the best talent in your industry. Access our comprehensive playbook filled with templates and tools tailored to fit your business needs and apply the resources right away to enhance your recruitment process and streamline hiring. Invest in your business's success by helping your management team become effective recruiters. Supercharge your hiring process today with the Ultimate Recruitment Toolkit, available at growersmallbusiness.com. 
What have you enjoyed the least about managing fast growth? All the temptations, I think, of wandering off into other businesses. As a business grows and you're not totally managing people directly anymore, with 54 employees, we've got a couple of layers of management. I'm not directly interacting every day with the people actually doing the work and meeting with the customers and so forth. And oftentimes I find it hard to get a message across that's not diluted by the time it gets to the person that's doing the work. I find that frustrating and something Thing that again goes back to management. How do we kind of communicate ideas that don't get like kind of watered down? You know, like the old broken telephone game. Like if it goes through two or three people, like it can get pretty garbled along the way. That's a challenge I found in dealing with a larger team is how to get points across without them becoming diluted or garbled along the way. What do you love most about growing a small business? Personally, I love recording the podcast that I do, and that's less of running the mm. business. I guess it's a luxury of having a great team in place that I am fortunate that I can take the time to do some of the pet projects, which are just fun to me. I do this podcast where I interview entrepreneurs who've sold their company and it's a fun thing to do. I get to talk to people who've just come out of selling their biggest asset and it's a really neat time of their lives and I get to document that. That's not really the answer to your question, but it's the answer to the question, you know, what do I enjoy most about my day? It's kind of that. Yeah, well, I really enjoy, I love doing our podcast as well. You're up to almost 440 episodes and I'm listening to two or three of your episodes a week to go through your back catalog. I think I'm up to Kate Fields episode 322. The Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm slowly getting there, but an amazing resource, John. I want to thank you and Dennis and Colin and the team putting that out because it's amazing material. Thanks. Yeah. When we first started the idea, there's a ton of information out there, how to build a business and how to grow a business, but there's very little on how to actually execute a successful exit. And so that's where we focus. It's been a good little niche for us. What has been the biggest mindset shift for you in your small business growth journey? I'm a big Carol Dweck fan. Are you familiar with Carol no. Dweck and the book no. Mindset? She wrote a book called Mindset. And what she discovered was that there were these two types types of people. One are called fixed mindset, the other a growth mindset. And she was a Stanford researcher and really documented this in a great book called Mindset. So I'll try to paraphrase it. Effectively, she found that fixed mindset people believe their traits are, are kind of God-given or like just hardwired. They just are what they are. They're either a good public speaker or they're not, or they're a good musician or they're not, or they're a good athlete or they're not. And, and oftentimes it comes down to parenting. Like if we praise our kids when they're young and say, oh, you're such a talented musician, you're such a talented author, you're such a talented creative person, person, they start to feel it's innate and not as a result of their hard work. It's just, well, I am talented. In a funny way, they plateau because they stop taking risks. And what Carol Dweck found was that the highest performing individuals are the ones with the opposite mindset, which is a growth mindset, which means that they do not believe their attributes are hardwired, whether they're athletic or not, musical or not, funny or not, can always be improved. And it found that the parents of people with a growth mindset usually praise the work, not the yeah. outcome. Super proud of the work you put into your chemistry test. Johnny, as opposed to, I'm glad you got 95% on that chemistry test because the latter would in reinforce a fixed mindset. Like my parents are going to not love me unless I get a really good mark. Therefore, I'm not going to challenge myself. I'm going to take easy courses because part of my wiring is to be proven. Whereas a growth mindset, the parent would be raising the work. That's reading that book both changed my parenting philosophy at a really important age in my kid's life, but it also helped me think about the values I wanted to instill in my company. In fact, one of the four values we have at Value Builder Culture values is having a growth mindset. So it's a big part of what we do. The number one habit you think a small business owner needs to develop and maintain? Discipline, discipline, discipline. We are all susceptible to shiny ball syndrome. Oh, the new product, the new launch, the new chapter, the new location. And I can tell you, because I've seen it now hundreds of times through the podcast, the more diversified businesses become, the less attractive they are to acquirers. That is a really, really difficult lesson for business owners to learn that the thing that looks really exciting and new. It's just, we are, not to go back to the fixed mindset, but I, I do believe that a lot of entrepreneurs are kind of wired to explore the new thing. We are overly sort of indexed towards what's new. And unfortunately, the most valuable businesses, at least the ones I've studied, are the ones that kind of do one thing, have one vision, and really stick to their knitting over decades. And that's hard to do. Now, you've had several businesses, John. Can you talk to how you've added people to the team, some wins, mistakes, and advice for those listening? Yeah, in the early days, when the company is sort of like, like, and your dog. Like I generally try to hire generalists who are scrappy, super resourceful, can do people, usually not super long on industry expertise because A, I can't afford them in the first few years of a business. And you know they're going to turn their nose up at doing work that's sort of they would consider beneath them or work that they're not specialized in. In the early days, it's just you want these jack of all trade type of people, which are like incredibly valuable in the early days. Over time, of course, the challenge is as a business, 
business grows, you start to need more specialized talent. And those jack of all trades kind of get run over. If they don't evolve and grow with the team, they eventually have to leave. Either they choose to go or what you need as a three employee company is different than what you need in the same role at a 30 employee company. And some people have the ability to grow with the organization. A lot don't though. It's an unfortunate part of growing a business. And I don't know the answer and maybe Troy, you do, but it's just an unfortunate ramification of building a successful company is you do need to swap out the people from time to time. Not all of them, hopefully, but again, the person that got you to 300 grand in revenue is probably not the same person that's going to be there at 5 million in revenue. Yeah. It's just not. Totally agree. And I've been through it a few times with my 15 businesses now. And it's, You've it's seen it. Yeah, it's painful, especially if you build a good friendship with some of these people and often you either don't see it or you're blinded by that friendship of the timing of, right, we need to step this up at a level. We need to go to market and get someone with a higher caliber skills in this corner of the business. And I see a lot, of, I've, I made the mistake and I've seen a lot of business owners delay that for far too long and pay for it. Yeah, it's challenging for sure. Because of all the things you say, you want to feel loyal to the people that brought you to the dance. There's a sense of loyalty there for sure. Yet they may not be the right people to get you to the next level. Yeah, that's right. And the way I talk to people about that is, well, you've got to put the business first. What's the best decision for the business? Think about it that way. Don't take the personalities out of it, you know, move through this decision. What are some of the things you recommend to building a sustainable and kick-ass culture to help with the growth? I'm not a culture guy. It would be a huge weakness and a complete broad for me to answer that question. I, that's not my wheelhouse at all. I look at companies that have a great culture or a seemingly great culture on the outside that bring the dog to work and everybody gets a medal and it's very like warm and collegial, a mixed emotion of jealousy on one end, as well as a little bit of skepticism. It's a mixed emotion. I've never been able to figure out the alchemy. I can figure out how to make a small group of people have a great time together and get nothing done. I can figure out how to get a small group of people to, to kick ass, but not necessarily like each other. I can figure out how to create a high performing team, but I just have never been able to create the kind of culture where people are like, I love coming to work and I would do anything from my boss and yet, and we're putting together amazing results. I've just never been able to do it. I'm like the worst guy to ask this question of. Well, this is episode 500 and no one's ever answered it that way, John. So thanks for being so frank <laughs> and tell our audience how you've handled balance. Yeah, this one's a biggie for me. So a couple things. I wrote a blog post years ago called Life in 10-Year Chunks. And for me, the one biggest attribute or asset of choosing the life of entrepreneurship is that you can step off the hamster wheel, the corporate ladder, so to speak, take a break and rejoin, and your skills do not atrophy. If you choose a more traditional career path, you want to become a lawyer, a doctor, a teacher, and you tell your boss, hey, I'd like to take a couple of years off and go to Thailand and write a book, and I'll, come, I'll be back. You lose your spot on the corporate hierarchy. You permanently basically destroy your career ascendancy because that's not the way the corporate world works. You go to work at Procter & Gamble, you go to work at a law firm and you say, I want to take two years off. It doesn't work. That's just not part of the DNA. Whereas entrepreneurship, you can do that. While the skills and how to like do a spreadsheet might change or how to well, AI might change, the fundamental core skills of being an entrepreneur do not change, I believe. And therefore, you can take a two-year sabbatical. And I've done that. I've, uh, a couple of times through my life, the most amazing experience of our life as a family was a three-year sabbatical I mentioned earlier in Europe where my kids were young at the time. They're now since much older, but at the time they were in those formative years where they they love still playing soccer with you in the backyard. And it was amazing because I spent those three years kind of kicking the soccer ball and playing in the swimming pool with my kids. I could never have done that if I had chosen a traditional career path. I'm a huge believer in this idea of carving up your life as an entrepreneur in 10-year chunks. Build a business, grow it as best as you can, and 10, 12 years later, sell the thing. Sell the thing and go do something else. Sell the thing and take a two, three, four year sabbatical, spend time, regroup, get in touch with what makes you excited again as a person, get healthy, and then go out, do it all over again. To me, that's what balance is this ability to take these like big, chunky sabbaticals every 10 years. And I'm a big believer in that as an idea. Yeah, I think, well, for me, because I love what I do, and that's certainly something that I've been working on the last few years is to take more of those chunks of time out in bigger chunks, like you said, but I think for some business owners, there is that affliction that they just absolutely love what they're doing and almost addicted to it. And it's hard for them not to keep working. Yeah, I think that's true. It's also true that it's hard to read the label from inside the bottle. I mean, like it's hard to know whether you're truly happy or inert. Like inertia is a powerful force. And you walk in and you see the orders from the night before and you see the employees and they're happy and they're doing the thing. And like, you've just got positive momentum and you're just moving in the right direction. And it's really hard to pull yourself up and say, okay, like I 
know what I'm doing. There's definitely gen like activity being generated, but until you pull yourself out of the milieu if, and really give yourself time to think, I don't know that you fully understand, am I truly happy what I'm doing or am I satisfied? There's a difference between inertia, being inert in a job, being satisfied versus like being super fulfilled by it. It's just worth checking in on yourself every once in a while to say, am I happy or am I just sort of satisfied? And how much professional development have you invested in yourself? Quite a bit. You know, I used to think of coaching as sort of something like other people bought, frankly. And then I went to sell that market intelligence business that I referenced earlier. And I was told in no uncertain terms that it wasn't worth what I thought it was worth and that I needed to make some changes. And, and we've sort of talked about and touched on some of those already. But it was then that I realized I needed some outside help. I hired a business coach. I hired an MA professional. And since then, I've been a much bigger user of coaching, both, you know, face-to-face -face virtual along with sort of indirect coaching that I get from books that I read. I'm a big podcast consumer, both because I have a podcast, but also I'm just a big fan of professional development. And, and I find podcasting is sometimes I, do you ever have those moments, Troy, when you're like, like, I can't believe this is free. Sometimes I'll be listening to podcasts. I'll be like, the value that I'm getting from this, I just like, I, it's, I feel kind of dirty taking this for free. Like it shouldn't be free. It's so valuable. It happens and, to me uh, yeah, three or four times a week when I'm listening to your podcast, when I'm shooting hoops in the sun. That's very generous. But anyways, I'm a big consumer of podcasts. So that's probably where I get a lot of my my personal development these days. Australians are the biggest consumers of podcasts in the world. 40% of people aged over 13 listen to at least one episode a week and 10% listen to six or seven a week. And another stat I heard is that consumption of podcasts, consumption is six times more than audio books at the moment. So podcasting is absolutely huge. Yeah. Six wow. Times. I, I did not know that about the Australian market. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. There you go. Well, that's worldwide, like six times the volume is consumed of podcasts, audio books. But yeah, Australians are per capita the biggest in the world. And you mentioned coaches. Have you had any mentors along the way? I have. Yeah. I've had a few mentors. It, probably my dad would be the person I, you know, like I guess a lot of people would point to in my spot, but he was the original entrepreneur in our family, even though he wasn't an entrepreneur. In 1976, he and my mom moved from England where there was all sorts of civil strife and, and trade union disputes at the time. I was a young kid. Margaret my my Thatcher, sister was yeah. young. Margaret Thatcher. Margaret Thatcher. Yeah. yeah. And he moved and he literally, they wouldn't let them, it was a time where they couldn't take much money out of England. They were restricted around taking cash out. And so he literally bought the, took all of his money and he bought a car and that was his safety net because he knew he could sell the car. It was physical. It was like a piece of metal and it would be worth something. We emigrated to Canada, but he came here with a car and he rented a house and he had two weeks. We came over on a boat and my dad flew over and he had two weeks to find a job, find a place to live. And he did both. And he kept a roof over our heads for my entire life. He was in a little part of him was a bit jealous of, of entrepreneurs, like the lifestyle and entrepreneurship. We would spend a lot of time at dinner table conversations talking about these entrepreneurs. And, and I got a sense from him that there was a little bit of jealousy, but I've never thought that he should feel sorry and for not doing it because I think he took the ultimate risk, which was moving a family in a very difficult situation and took huge risk and, and provided for us for all those years. So he's kind of my biggest mentor. Yeah. And do you have a board of directors or advisors? No, we don't. We have some advisors who we tap. As I mentioned, Value Builder, we license it and they provide a little bit of feedback. We have an informal group that provides feedback on the product, but it's more of a product advisory board than a company advisory board. We tap them for you know, product ideas and so forth. Yeah, great. Now, probably five to 10% of our guests have exited a business. You are arguably the godfather of business exiting. Any advice or one piece of advice maybe for the audience and think when they're thinking of exiting their business one day? Yeah, it's hard to put 30, 20 years worth of life work, <laughs> life work yeah. into one five minute clip, but I, I'll try. What I would say is that most businesses are reactive to the product process of selling. So the two most common reasons a business owner sells their company are number one, they have a health scare. Either they have a health event or someone in their family has a health event and they realize they've got to sell. Or number two, they are proactively approached by an acquirer. And in both of those cases, the entrepreneur is on their back foot. They're reacting in some cases in real time to what's being asked. And it's a recipe for being taken advantage of in the negotiation because you're not prepared. You may say something early in the conversation that you wish you hadn't later on. I would just coach people to really think proactively about the end game. That doesn't mean you have to sell your company tomorrow. Mm. It does mean you have to think roughly what is your end game? Like, is it to go out boots first and die in the saddle, which is totally legit if that's what you want to do? Or is it to pass it to the kids? Or is it to bring on a new stream of managers and sell equity to them over time? Is it to sell the private equity 
or to a financial acquirer or to a strategic acquirer. What's the end game? And then also like roughly what's your timing around that? Are you decades away, years away, months away? And with those two pieces of information, you can start to know how the movie ends. And what I mean by that is we've all watched movies where the second time through, we kind of know what's going to happen. And it provides like the framework or the, the architecture of the narrative. Once you know your end game and your timing, it's not too hard to figure out what the likely movie parts or scenes are going to be. And then you can prepare for those scenes. But if you just kind of stick your head in the sand and say, oh, I'll sell when I'm ready. Or you know, what will likely happen is you'll get a call in your door one day from somebody and you'll fall into a conversation that during which you will reveal insights about your business, which will ultimately undermine the value of your company. And again, I've seen it over and over again where business owners end up regretting their decision to sell because they weren't proactive about it. The seven Ps, prior preparation and planning prevents piss poor performance. You get a much better exit value if you just are more intentional about it. Exactly right. All right, John, we're on to our final five questions. What do you think is the hardest thing in growing a small business? Probably the people. And if I were to go a step layer deeper than that, probably hiring salespeople to replace yourself. For a lot of entrepreneurs, they are the rainmaker for their company. And for many of us, it's almost an unconscious competence, meaning we're good at it, but we don't really know why. We hire salespeople and they fall short of expectations. It's like, why aren't they selling as well as I could? Or why didn't they sell that customer? That was an easy fastball down the middle. And yet it's really hard to hire salespeople. And again, it goes back a little bit to salespeople often sell through repetition. They like they learn through memorization. They learn through reps. Whereas a lot of entrepreneurs sell because they have industry credibility. They're like really, really well known in the industry. And so they walk into a sales conversation. The sale is three quarters done by that because they walk in, they're the HVAC guy that's been in the industry for 36 years. Their name's on the back of the van. They walk in, they have ultimate credibility and they say, yeah, you need a new furnace. The guy goes, all right, how much? And the deal's done, right? Whereas a kid 25 walks in and says, hey, you might want to get a new furnace. And they're like, prove it to me, basically. And so they have none of the credibility. We have to recognize, I think, when we're hiring salespeople that they don't have the same breadth of industry experience that we do. And as a result, we've got to narrow the scope of what they're selling down to a couple of products and just let them have reps. Yeah, totally agree with you. I, I believe people are the hardest thing in small business and the greatest asset to steal from one of Jim Collins' quotes. I also agree on that the sales role is really difficult to get right and because it is often the last hat the owner takes off. I've just finished an excellent book. Have you read The Jolt Effect? I have actually. I've had Matt Dixon on the podcast in a couple of weeks. Yeah, it's a great book. Oh, it's amazing insight. I won't go into it, but yeah, I highly recommend the audience listen to that. They focus in, thanks to COVID, they were able to put two and a half million Zoom sales calls through their machine learning to find some amazing insights around the SOAP sale process, specifically around the no decision or the indecision of 40 to 60% of sales. I encourage people to have a read of that. I agree wholeheartedly. It's a great book. Favorite business book, which has helped you the most, and you can't say any of your three books. I can't say jolt. I really love a book called Small Giants by Bo Burlingham. Have you ever read that? I have, yeah. Because was he co-author with Jack Stack on The Great Game of Business? Yeah, he wrote The Stake in the Outcome and The Great Game of Business with Jack Stack, who's yep. the kind of employee ownership guru guy. And he was an editor in, in at large for Inc. Magazine, which is kind of a US version, of like kind of like BRW. Is BRW still going, by the way? No, I think that closed at about eight years ago. Okay. For folks who, who haven't heard of BRW, it's like a magazine for entrepreneurs. Anyway, Bo wrote a book called Small Giants and it's about the pursuit of being great instead of being big. Again, it kind of goes back a little bit to what we were talking about earlier about this focus on value as opposed to revenue growth. It's a little different and Bo is just a beautiful writer and he was also, backstory, when I first wrote Built to Sell, it was a self-published book. I didn't know anything about publishing a book. I put together the, just the crappiest version and I sent a copy to him. I didn't know him, but he, he was good enough to write me an email back saying, I really like your book. Kind of reminds me of a modern day e-myth is what he said, yep. which was very huge mm -hmm praise to me because I'm a big Michael Gerber fan. Yeah, me too. And and Bo said, I think we can get this published. I'll introduce you to my agent. He introduced me to his agent. The agent introduced me to a random house, bought it. And I don't think we'd be having this conversation had it not been for Bo. Wow. I'm a huge Bo Berlian fan. And that's one of his many wonderful books. Any great podcasts, or online learning tools you use for your own professional development? I'm a big Scott Galloway fan. Do you know Scott Galloway's podcast? Name sounds familiar. Yeah, no. Prof G show. Prof G. Okay. No, I haven't. Prof G is great. All In is great too, if you know All In, moderated by Jason Calacanis and a group of venture capitalists. It's a little bit inside baseball. So if you're not kind of into the tech scene, it might not resonate for you. But I, I find that's a really nice juxtaposition because I think All In leans politically to the right. And in some cases, like David Sachs, like far to the right. And then Prof, Gall Prof G kind of leans a little bit to the left. And my habit is I listen to both every week and I get kind of both political perspectives. And I'll Oftentimes they'll riff on the same idea in a 
public sphere, what's going on in the business universe, and just hearing the different interpretation of the same facts by mm -hmm. the different political leanings is a nice, I find it to be a good juxtaposition. Those two I would recommend. One tool you'd recommend to help grow a small business? Yeah, I know you're a big net promoter score fan. I think that's a great tool for uh, business owners to really focus on. It's a very simple way to measure customer satisfaction, and it's very highly predictive of the future growth rate of your company. It's kind of like a Swiss army knife of customer satisfaction surveys. It's like, it'll predict your growth. It'll tell you who's likely to repurchase from you. It'll tell you what you're doing wrong and how to improve it. Like, And it's one question that's easy for your customers to complete. Mm. I'm a big NPS fan, so that's a cool tool to use. Yeah, me too. I'll link through to a blog post I wrote 12, 14 years ago. I'm way back from London on the beach in Thailand about Net Promoter School. Started in the 90s by Bain & Co. One question, it's a really powerful way to, and easy way to measure loyalty. Final, my favorite question. What would you tell yourself on day one of starting out? Was it 31 or 32 years ago, John, in business, your first business? Yeah, it was. I would tell myself, stop planning and start doing. In the early days, I can remember, I'm embarrassed to tell you this now, but my first business idea was to take that radio show and create an audio magazine. Okay, so we know what a magazine is. So the, my idea was an audio magazine. So at the time, it was cassette tapes that you put in your car. I know some of the younger listeners are going to be like, what's a cassette tape? But it's a little tape you put in your car and you listen to it. And it would you'd listen to interviews like we're having right now. And I decided I was going to do it on a magazine on subscription. And I spent hours and hours and hours butsing over the logo, making sure the logo was perfect and the colors were right and the design was just right. And of course, it had to be five colors, right? Every envelope we had printed that the tech cassette tapes would be mailed out in were five times more because we had five colors. And then <laughs> the cassette tapes needed the sticker on top, which had five cuts. We sold probably 30 subscriptions before I basically ran out of money and had to shut the company <laughs> down. My point in sharing that is like so many entrepreneurs, I think, spend so much time. And I did this on like the, ins the superficial shit. Like what's the logo look like? And, and like, what's our website going to look like? And like building this spreadsheet out for like year nine of the business, right? It's <laughs> just like, how about we take it back to month one? In fact, day one and, and go talk to a couple people and see if they'll buy. That's really the ultimate acid test as to whether you have something. That's probably what I tell myself. Thank you so much for your time today, John. I've really been looking forward to recording episode 500 with you. As I said, we try and leave the 400, 500, 600 episode numbers for rock stars. Really enjoy the podcast that you put out. I think I said to you before we hit record, Mark Wright was the first one I listened to on your podcast and Aussie who went on to the UK Apprentice and won that. Built it from one to 130 full-time team members at eight and a half years and sold for nine and a half times EBITDA all cash, which is phenomenal. That's a great episode. And the other one I really enjoyed was the two you did with James Ashford. Oh, wonderful. Yeah. That's it. Thanks for listening. Please leave a review in iTunes or whatever platform you listen to us on. It means more small business owners will find our cast and help people with their business growth journey.